Good afternoon, good morning, uh, good evening, depending on where you are located, and welcome to uh, our webinar today on the Global Off-Grid Solar Market Report for the latter part of 2020. Uh, my name is Susie Wilden, I'm the Head of Communications and Insights at Gogler, the Association for the Off-Grid Solar Industry. Uh, and I'm going to be joined in this, uh, in this presentation by um, four of the uh, report authors who are going to be giving some of their key insights into the data and the in and trends that we're seeing from that latter part of last year. Um, the, the sales and data collection is, is undertaken by Gogler jointly uh, with the Lighting Global uh, program and also the Efficiency for Access Coalition. And we're also really lucky to have with us today Itoto Niagi from the uh, Lighting Global program I'll be um, opening with a few remarks at the beginning. Uh, the Lighting Global program is ending at the end of June uh, this year and has been absolutely instrumental in terms of catalyzing the off-grid solar sector. Uh, there are very many things that the program has done, but uh, in particular related to this, uh, this research and this report, um, the Lighting Global um, program really was the, was the originator of the, the data collection that we, we now see today. Uh, through Gogler and has remained in close partnership um, with that data collection every six months and now joined by the Efficiency Co um, Coalition, for Access Coalition colleagues. Um, and so we're really delighted that Atosha will be able to, to kick us off today. Um, before I hand over to, um, to all of our, our panellists, um, I just wanted to let you know that of course you're able to take part as well in Q&A at the end of the session. So please do submit your questions into the, to the Q&A box at the bottom. If there's a particular panelist you want to target your question to, please do that. Um, you can also vote on other people's questions. If there's one that you love, please do and give it a tick because it means that if we run out of time, I'm able to ensure that we ask the most popular questions. Uh, and a couple of points of order, just to, to note that the session will be recorded and shared afterwards. Um, and if you do experience problems, do pop that into the chat and we'll see what we can do to try and sort those out as well. But before I hand over to Etosha, I'm hoping you might be able to um, take part a little bit sooner into this process and just uh, share with us the type of organization that you, you, you come from. I'm going to be opening the poll now. Um, and if you can just add in there um, the description of your organization that best fits, um, that would be fantastic. Uh, it helps us to make sure that we're gearing our report and research um, to, to the audiences that we have as effectively as possible, even perhaps within this webinar that we can make sure that some of the insights or responses um, are, are gonna be suited to, to you guys as our, our, our audience today. Um, and it's yeah, really just helpful for us to have that kind of insight. So I can see that quite a lot of people have already submitted. I'm just going to leave it another few seconds uh, so that we can get to over 80%. I see we've got, we're at 76. Can we get above 80? Anyone else able to, to vote? Let me leave it open for another 10 seconds and see if we can get one or two more participants. We are almost there. Let me let me close it now and then and then share. I think what we're seeing here is that the the, the main uh, chunk of, of organisations here are off grid solar um, companies. Uh, we've also got uh, quite some strong representation representation from investment in the development finance community as well as as well as others. So welcome all, and but thank you so much for for helping us with uh, with that poll. Let me close the poll now. Um, I'll close, oopsie, sorry, bear with me one second, I'll get back to my presentation. So without further ado, let me hand over to Itosha Nagi from the Lighting Global Program. Thanks, Susie, and uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Uh, I know we have um, people all the way from China to the US or across uh, different time zones. Many thanks, Susie, for the for the welcome. It's our 11th year in partnership with the Gogla, and it's been really a great experience in terms of just um, how far we have come. And I think uh, you highlighted the aspect of uh, the data collection. It is indeed one of the key things that we started off uh, back in 2009. And as we close the program, and uh, what tends to happen within uh, the World Bank group is that uh, most of these programs have a uh, kind of a finite time period in which they exist. So we've been going uh, on and on and on like an energizer battery for the last 11 years. And uh, yeah, on the IFC side of the Lighting Global Program is coming to an end, but we are evolving into something different. And I think something interesting and that's uh, most appropriate for most of the companies on this call. Uh, our focus uh, from now on is going to be largely focusing on uh, really mobilizing financing and investments for companies 
with the local financial institutions. So we'll still come across each other, but uh, perhaps wearing a different hat. Uh, and the market development aspect will still remain a core element of the World Bank Group through the, through the World Bank and, uh, and of course through the Gogla program. Uh, but for today, I think I really wanted to highlight on an aspect of uh, the data collection that I think uh, we are really proud of in terms of uh, where we started and uh, where it is now. A really complicated and uh, a fairly sophisticated tool that I think uh, companies have access to in terms of uh, different sites that they can be able to go to and query the data in numerous ways. We started it off as a very simple Excel worksheet with about 10 companies in uh, 2009, 2010. Uh, and it's just uh, grown in stature o o over time. And I'm hoping that uh, I think uh, the companies have found this uh, really rewarding and in terms of uh, being instrumental in terms of their planning and their strategy development. Uh, but I think what we see from our end is just how much uh, the investors have appreciated an independent entity tracking the sales and for them being able to validate uh, some of the assumptions or some of the premises that on which they are basing their investments on. So in that sense, I think we're really proud of the fact that uh, it's now a tool that is, uh, that is taken very seriously by the industry and investors at large and also quoted uh, widely. And it's an evolution. I think uh, we are hoping that in the next uh, number of years uh, through Gogla and through the World Bank Group, they'll continue refining this tool. So on our part, I think uh, as the Lighting Global, we, on the IFC side, we just wanted to really appreciate the support that um, you have all provided to us, companies, investors, everybody generally across all the facets and the segments of the people on this call in terms of just refining this tool. Uh, we'll still remain on the other end of the fence on, on the financing side, which I think everybody is looking forward to. And uh, I think I'm really looking forward to uh, greater heights that these industries will, will go to. So thanks, Susie. That was about it from my side and uh, really glad to be on this call. Uh, I don't know whether it was opening remarks or farewell remarks, uh, but I think uh, we are not too far off. Thank you. Thanks so much, Atosha. I'm pleased to know that it's a, it's very much not a not a farewell, but a, a leap into something a little bit different and new. And again, from our side, thank you so much for all of the Lighting Global support for this process. Um, so with, uh, what I'll do now is hand over to, to some of the team who've been working very hard on the insights gathered um, from the, the six months at, at the end of uh, 2020. Um, of course, very much uh, still feeling the impact of the COVID pandemic. Um, each of them will share um, one of their, their main uh, findings from, from the data uh, and, then, and then pass around the group and then we'll, we'll come back around for a second insight from each of, the, uh, each of our expert panelists. Um, in, that, in which case I'll, I'll start, of course, with, uh, with my, my colleague at Gogler, Chef Ketelas. Over to you, Chef. Yeah, thanks, Susie, uh, and hi, everyone. Uh, glad you can join us. Um, yeah, last round, we didn't really know what to expect in terms of, uh, of, of, in terms of sales volumes and what the impact of, uh, of COVID-19 would be. Uh, back then, we registered the lowest sales volume since 2014. Uh, and this round, we were, of course, hoping to see uh, that sales improved again. Um, my first highlight is that we indeed see early signs of, of slow recovery uh, with 3.6 million units sold. Uh, this was 3.1 million units uh, in last round. Um, but overall, sales in 2020 are still the lowest that we've seen uh, since 2015. So the situation is still very serious. Uh, and we also see very large differences uh, between uh, regions. Uh, here you see a slide uh, with the differences in terms of sales between the four main regions. Uh, uh, and please note that I'm comparing between the second half of 2020 and the second half of 2019. Um, this is because we often see strong seasonal patterns in sales. So for example, in East Africa, uh, the second half of the year is often stronger, which, might, which is why it makes more sense to compare the sales in this round with the sales in, uh, in the second half of uh, 2019. Um, so compared to, 20, to H2 2019, the largest decrease we saw was in the Middle East uh, and North Africa. Uh, in this region, we mostly see bulk procurement sales of solar lanterns as part of uh, humanitarian efforts. Uh, sales are usually strongest in the first half of the year, so it's not surprising that uh, the sales are lower this time compared to, to the last round. But even compared to uh, the second half of 2019, uh, sales were 70% 70 uh, lower. Uh, and this is worrying as it indicates that fewer people living in humanitarian settings, people that really benefit from these, from these products uh, had access to them. Um, 
Another relatively large decrease was visible in South Asia with 43%. Uh, sales stabilized somewhat compared to, to the last round, uh, but overall sales have been on a downward trajectory since the beginning of 2018. Um, this is mostly due to the continuation of uh, low sales rates in India, which is the largest market in the region. Uh, and in 2020, this can partly be explained because uh, microfinance institutions with our, which are the main channels for, uh, for off-grid solar products in the country uh, struggled due to, uh, due to the pandemic. In East Africa, uh, sales increased again uh, compared to last round, uh, but they're still below the levels that we saw in the second half of uh, 2019. Um, however, we do see very large, or we do see large differences between uh, the different countries, and I will touch upon that later in the, in the webinar. We are pleased to see growth in West Africa and also Central Africa, which is not in this graph. Um, last round sales in the region um, were relatively stable. And this time we actually see uh, an increase, which is really encouraging, uh, especially seeing that the market in West Africa is still relatively nascent compared to the markets in East Africa and uh, South Asia. And then lastly, what I would like to highlight is that we did a back of the, uh, back of the envelope calculation. Uh, and we estimate that due to the reduction in sales in 2020, uh, we see uh, that 10 to 15 million people uh, were not able to benefit from, uh, from off-grid solar. It's not only about sales, it's also about the impact uh, that these products make. Uh, and it's a real shame that so many people have missed out on the opportunity to, uh, to have access to these products. And with that, uh, I would like to, uh, to pass it on to, uh, to Leo. Thank you very much, Chef. So as um, it's a bit of a uh, no brainer to start off with here, but um, the pandemic continued to put pressure on all of the companies. This is one of the major messages that we all know. We've been wondering how much. And so what I want to do here is go into a little bit of details here of what trends we've started to observe, um, differentiating, if you like, the response or the, uh, the performance of companies during this period. So we are starting to tentatively and um, quite honestly, you know, um, optimistically call this uh, some level of recovery, um, but we are seeing an uneven recovery across companies as well as the different business models. So, so what do we mean by that? Well, the first of three points is that overall, we've had two thirds of all of these off-grid solar lighting companies have, have reported lower sales. Um, in the second half of 2019 um, in comparison with the previous half. As you can see here from the graph as well, uh, we can look at how sales compare over the longer time um, period. We again see over half of these companies having decreased over 25%, but a third of these have had reductions of more than 50%. Now, because of confidentiality um, and uh, the way the report works. Of course, we're not going to be disclosing which kinds of companies um, have had these different levels of performance. But I think one thing we want to touch on here is as we've seen in the press, many companies with access to patient capital, with additional finance, with even concessional um, grants, uh, they, companies have been receiving this support, which has enabled them to weather the storm with the ultimate benefit of helping those end consumers retain their access. So there's a large donor support, of course, and recognized by all impact investors to support the end users whose lives we're all out to transform ultimately. And so one of the big um, hopes we have for this next period is that the sector-wide energy access relief fund is going to start moving into disbursement. And that is deliberately targeting some of the smaller companies which don't otherwise have access to capital to see through this period. So we're very um, optimistic and hopeful um, about a better picture next round for that as well. So um, with that said, I wanted to segment sales. If you can have a look here between the difference of cash and paygo, again, kind of intuitively, um, we are seeing that um, cash has overall gone down by about a quarter compared to last row, um, sorry, compared to the previous year. Um, but it is still getting stronger, higher than the previous reporting period. The real story seems to be in the pay-go segment, which, as we would expect, people who can defer payment now to the future, um, that's a great preference. And so we are seeing that um, the sales of pay-go are more resilient overall. And they have had just a very small drop in that um, first half of 2020. So these um, compared to um, that, pay-go sales have reached the same level as the second half of 2019. 
So in that sense, they're stabilizing. But the backstory, of course, is that we were all seeing and hoping for a great growth um, in particularly in that area, as all of the trends have been indicating how customers are preferring PayGo and also because um, of the ability to pay over time and reduce your upfront cost. Um, one of the issues, of course, the industry will be tracking is that um, long term uh, security, if you like, of sales made to people who may have um, challenging incomes at the moment. And so that is one of the areas that we know companies um, and development partners are watching very keenly. Um, how do uh, end users uh, sustain their payments in times of crisis? So um, we leave that on um, a somewhat optimistic note, uh, as much as is reasonable during this uh, period of great uncertainty. I'll hand back over to Mina, who's going, uh, Michael, <laughs> who's going to take us on um, the appliance side. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Leo. Um, I think I'm just going to further drill down this uh, what very evident uh, trend that we're seeing in the off-grid space. Um, so generally, uh, the sales for uh, from this reporting period, uh, or rather from this round, uh, we do see that there has been some major uh, disruptions uh, in economies. Economies have contracted, uh, disruption in key uh, in key supply chains, but. Uh, for the uh, for the off-grid appliance sector, we do see some 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 little resilience, uh, and even though the sales uh, this round are lower than uh, those uh, experienced or rather those reported in the last round, we do see a two a two a two percentage uh, decrease uh, from from the last round. But uh, comparing these two pre-COVID uh, numbers, we do we do see that there is a two percent increase and. Uh, as, 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 as Leo has mentioned that, you know, it's very much uneven across different categories and even across different markets. Uh, for instance, like when we look at funds, we do see that funds have kind of reduced uh, from, the, from the last round. Uh, but comparing this to, 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 to 2019, the second half of 2019, and for funds, I should mention that uh, they have a very seasonal trend whereby uh, the second half always has lower, lower, lower reported sales compared to the first half because of uh, the pre-booking uh, that normally happens. Uh, but uh, when you're comparing this, uh, this, this, this round and uh, the second half of 2019, you do see that there is a 49% increase, which is actually quite, uh, which is actually quite uh, promising and quite positive. And, and um, um, drilling down further, I, I think, I think one of the interesting things that we've seen uh, for this round is that there has been uh, very interesting uh, numbers or rather high sales recorded in, in West Africa. Uh, it's not in this graph, but uh, some very, very positive numbers in, in West Africa, whereby uh, uh, we have about, you know, about 3000 percentage increase in terms of uh, sales there. So it's very, very interesting. And uh, one of the things, one of the reasons why uh, we think this is happening is, you know, more and more solar houses, home system kits are being uh, uh, bundled together with uh, with funds. Um, uh, moving moving to TVs, um, uh, TVs TVs did, did did experience some slight increase compared to the last round, uh, but uh, this is still below, uh, uh, you know, the numbers reported in the second half of uh, 20, 2019. Uh, uh, one of the interesting uh, highlights that we're seeing, and this is rather anecdotal data from uh, um, uh, from companies, is that um, more and more companies uh, are bundling their, their solar home system kits with TVs, and also even uh, to some extent some uh, uh, some some solar water pump companies. Is, uh, and I think uh, Andrew will talk will talk more about that. Um, Looking at refrigerators, refrigerator units. Uh, this this round, they did. Uh, they they have been dipping since uh, since the last two rounds. Actually, the last three rounds, um, whereby we have a twenty three percent decrease um, from the last round, and about a six percent decrease from the uh, from the second half of twenty nineteen. But uh, this this market has been nascent uh, with very very slow growth uh, that you know we've been seeing over the. Over the years, and since we started collecting this data, uh, partly because we think uh, you know this is the refrigerators are quite expensive, um, uh, and affordability is usually a key uh, a key barrier to 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 you know to the penetration of these appliances. But uh, 
you know, just looking at the numbers, we have we see that most of these units uh, they're mostly sold through Bego systems, and uh, it just goes to show just how much uh, consumer financing uh, is very very crucial for uh, for the penetration and uh, promotion of these appliances. Uh, one of the things that we uh, we would like to highlight for this report, and I know uh, that you know it might have been you know expected or rather anticipated that. Uh, uh, that we will have uh, lots of vaccine uh, fridges being sold uh, in anticipation of COVID vaccination. But uh, in this particular round, we do not uh, we do not in, in, uh, include those as normally these are normally centrally procured through organizations such as, such as the World Health Organization or Gavi. So uh, these are not included in this. And lastly, uh, just uh, highlighting on the key highlights for the for solar water pumps. Solar water pumps did very well, we do see a relative increase of about 134%, uh, which is very, very positive. And uh, just uh, uh, just looking at the potential impact is, you know, as has been highlighted in a, in a recent report by the Efficiency for Access Coalition, that's the off grid plants market survey report, uh, which shows that, you know, solar water pumps still rank fast in terms of, uh, you know, uh, perceived consumer value for off grid or productive use appliances. And, and even the anticipated or rather the potential impact for these appliances. So uh, this is very, very evident. And uh, it's been very interesting to just see how uh, sales of these uh, solar water pumps has been growing uh, in, in the West African market. Uh, but I will touch more about, uh, about solar water pumps in, in my next highlight. But for now, I'm going to pass it over to Andrew. Thanks, Mike. Um, so I'm going to take you into a bit of a deeper dive into a specific appliance, which are TVs, um, and to highlight that we, for, for the first time in a while, we've lost sight of the small TVs category, um, but that contrasts to a good growth that we're seeing in the extra large TVs category. Um, and then you'll see that the, the medium and large TVs have stayed fairly stable with a small increase in medium TVs and a small decrease in large TVs. Um, so there's a couple of potential reasons for this. One, one possible explanation is that the efficiency of larger TVs uh, is becoming more and more, um, more and more improved and the price difference between larger and smaller TVs is, is minimal. So people are getting more efficient TVs that they're able to run on their solar home systems um, for a similar, if not slightly, slightly higher price. Um, but the perceived value of having a larger TV is more significant. So um, that, that's one possible explanation. And uh, I think the recent research carried out by the Efficiency for Access Coalition in the, the Data Trends Report which really delves into the efficiencies of different size TVs uh, and the running costs really helps to support this. Um, so another potential, um, another potential explanation for this increase in extra large TV sales is that more and more we're seeing uh, larger TVs bundled with solar home systems. Um, and also that anecdotally we, we're seeing kind of uh during the lockdown periods that wealthier customers were purchasing larger tvs um tvs being kind of critical to keeping people entertained and keeping people into, informed so a good source of news and um highlighting what's going on in their local area um so positive overall for for the the larger tv category um, and I think indicative of how things will continue to go in the future in terms of TV sizing. Uh, and with that, I'll hand back to Chef. Thanks, Andrew. Um, yeah, for my second insight, uh, I want to focus on the sales in, uh, in East Africa, the lighting sales. Um, so in my first slide, uh, I showed that sales improved compared to the first half of 2020, but they still decreased with 10% compared to the second half of 2019. Um, and that said, there are very or quite large differences uh, between countries. Uh, and when you look at this graph, the countries on the left-hand side uh, showed an increase in sales uh, compared to the second half of 2019. Uh, and the countries on the right experienced decreases. 
uh, at least load net Somalia and Zimbabwe are not uh, are not on this graph. One of the interesting things for us were the sales in Kenya, uh, the largest market for off-grid solar, uh, which increased again uh, compared to last round to a level uh, that is slightly higher than uh, than we saw in uh, H2 2019, with over 1 million units sold, and that's for the first time. Uh, in a way, that is really great news, uh, but we were hoping also for stronger growth in the second half of the year. Uh, and one of the things that we were curious to better understand uh, was the impact of the VAT change in, uh, in the country. The Kenyan government uh, reintroduced the 14% VAT uh, on off-grid solar products in July of last year, and that increased, increased to 16% uh, this year, uh, making products more expensive for, uh, for customers. And we were curious to learn uh, how this have might impact its sales. Uh, what I want to stress is that I, uh, I don't want to make any strong claims here as the data that we have uh, does not allow me to do so. But we dug a bit deeper. Uh, and what we actually saw was that the increase in sales uh, in Kenya uh, was driven by only by growth in the, in the portable lantern segment. So we noticed that sales of multi-light kits um, have been on a downward trajectory uh, over the past one and a half years, so since age 2 2019. Uh, and over the same period, the sales of solar home systems have plateaued or flatlined, uh, selling around 250,000 units, uh, units uh, each round. Uh, so looking at these, at these figures, uh, this suggests that people are struggling with affordability uh, because of the pandemic, uh, because of increased VAT costs, uh, leading to a decreasing or flatlining uh, sales in, in the larger product segments. Um, this was also anecdotally confirmed by, by several companies, uh, and this is an issue, as you would expect or at least hope, that uh, people are able to climb the energy staircase, that they're able to buy larger products uh, and getting access to higher tiers of energy access. Um, and we were also hoping that uh, seeing the increased, uh, increased awareness in the beginning of the year, uh, with uh, President Kenyatta opening the off-grid solar forum in Nairobi, uh, the COSOP RBF uh, scheme launching its second window in September, uh, that growth will actually be higher than, uh, than the 4% that we see now compared to age 2019. Uh, but this is not the case. And uh, yeah, we have to see in the next few rounds what the long-term impact will be of the VAT change uh, and the pandemic. In regard to the other countries, uh, I'll keep it short. Uh, I think the main the main takeaway there is that uh, when countries experienced uh, strong growth, uh, this is often because we see uh, government support or prog programmatic uh, interventions. Uh, for example, in Madagascar, uh, sales were positively positively impacted by uh, by the off-grid market development fund, which is a 40 million US dollar uh, RBF. Uh, and in Mozambique, there were several supporting programs which had a positive impact on sales as well. Uh, in countries with lower sales compared to the to the second half of 2019, um, countries like Uganda and Zambia and Ethiopia, uh, yeah, this can partly be explained by uh, by the lack of such programs, but also by extreme weather, uh, political instability, uh, amongst other things. Uh, so all in all, I yeah, I wanted to provide uh, uh, a bit of nuance to the sales numbers that we see in uh, in East Africa. It's a mixed picture, uh, with some countries experiencing uh, strong growth whereas others uh, are not back to the, to the levels that, see, that we saw in, uh, in 2019. Uh, and with that, let me hand over back to, uh, to Leo. Thank you, I think you can hear me now. Thank you very much, Jeff. So yeah, as we've now been just looking at that geographic diversity, um, we're going to give a little bit of a drill down into the difference between the product categories. Um, as, as was just mentioned there, there's already, we've, noted some of the observations. Um, but the bottom line are that none of those uh, category sales reached the level that we saw in that comparable um, period of 2019. So we have seen individual drops across uh, there when you add them all together. Um, overall, again, coming back to uh, potentially to price is that we've seen an increase um, in the portable lantern sale, um, only the smallest, which do include mobile phone charging which again just reflects back to what is the smallest appliance that can, uh, the smallest um, power supply that can also power an appliance with mobile phones being one of the most valuable. Um, so that category really is um, where people start getting multiple use. Um, so, and that has increased overall um, across all of the countries. Um, when you now look at Paygo, we see that that has again really um, drilling down into the previous uh, 
observation, it's really starting um, to show a, a big difference. We have over 29% there um, in the multi-light segment um, being PAYGO, which is only around a third. Um, but when you start getting into the larger kits, the same kind of trend that we have, of course, been reporting on over the years and what one would expect as you get a more expensive product, then a large amount of people are buying that over the um, PAYGO methodology. Um, and so pay as you go um, approach does include 45%, which is actually a slight drop from last time. And while in the larger systems of this 11 watt and above, we've aggregated them all together. Um, and you can see almost 90% of all sales um, were, were made through PAYGA. So that really is quite um, a great emphasis there. This is larger than we have seen before. And I just want to unpack that. Um, on the one side, when we use the phrase PAYGO, that actually in the um, methodology includes any products that are sold um, not with full cash um, on, on delivery, on pickup. So that does include microfinance purchase sales as well. Um, so that's, that pay-go figure includes both traditional pay-as-you-go plus products sold um, through microfinance. But also it's worth noticing that on the cash side, when products are bought in bulk through a large tender, for example, with governments that we've seen is um, still fairly popular, when a tender sale goes through, then that is also classed in cash. So in previous rounds, we have seen several governments, um, particularly in Southeast Asia, as has been reported in previous reports, which have been supporting those um, bulk purchase um, initiatives. And therefore, again, you can see that a decrease in cash sales also can reflect that decrease in um, the amount of tenders for those larger systems during the period. So there is a lot to say in this category, um, but overall we wanted to share some of those uh, main highlights, which are again really reinforcing um, those, those earlier trends. We are seeing, um, if you drill down into the, uh, into the graphs, you can see again um, how the individual categories of 11 to 20, 21 to 49, 50 to 100 and 100 plus, how they have fared. And uh, in the 100 plus, that's one of those areas you can see a large spike some years ago. Um, a, a lot of these individual um, trends, as we say, are reflective of individual country policies with large purchases or uh, government support, as well as the individual company expansions. So um, I'd like to move on and uh, pass over to Mike. Um, he can drill down a bit on the uh, further appliance insights. Thank you. Thanks, Leo. Um... So for solar water pumps, uh, this has always been a very, uh, um, very interesting appliance for, for us as a, as a coalition, as efficiency for access coalition, uh, lots of potential in this work, lots of uh, uh, you know, uh, growth that we've seen uh, over the last couple of rounds. Uh, and um, just, uh, just looking at uh, further at, this, at these sales uh, for, this, uh, for this particular round, as I mentioned, we do have a very huge increase in terms of sales uh, compared to the last round. Uh, but I know from this graph, you can you can notice a very huge drop from the um, from the second half of uh, 2019, I guess, uh, where uh, we had very many sales, uh, almost up to almost up to 30,000, uh, uh, which was really much attributed to government programs in uh, in Southeast Asia. Uh, but the, those programs did end, and now we're just looking at uh, uh, numbers mostly from the East African market, uh, East Africa and West African market, uh, which have been the main uh, uh, the main markets for for solar water pumps. Um, so just uh, looking at looking at uh, we're trying to we're to, just trying to understand why you know why, why we do see these kinds of trends. As I mentioned, that you know. So water pumps do have a very, uh, you know, do have a very huge potential developmental uh, potential, uh, uh, and also the perceived uh, consumer value, uh, even from uh, from companies that we've interviewed in the past, and even from consumers that we've talked to uh, through uh, programs such as the Global Leap RBF, uh, they do mention that, uh, you know, considering that you know many of the farmers in in, in Africa or in sub sub-Saharan Africa, they're smallholder farmers, they uh, a solar water pump, uh, and in the face of the changing climate, is very, very is a very, very crucial uh, appliance to have. But um, 
but looking at uh, one of the reasons why this, you know, despite the growth that we are seeing uh, mostly uh, in the East African market and West African market, uh, is because of, uh, you know, uh, we, we do think that, you know, affordability is still, is still a very, very major issue. Uh, looking at this, uh, uh, at the typical price of a, of, a, uh, of, a, of, a, of a surface pump and that of a submersible pump, definitely these are not very much affordable to, the, uh, to, to, to most uh, low income consumers. And, and most of these do, uh, do require consumer financing or at least a payment plan for this uh, to be able to be sold. And looking at the last round, you do see that majority of these, and even not just the last round, uh, most of the sales uh, happening uh, in about the last couple of, uh, or rather four rounds, we do see that Pago sales, they're higher than, uh, than those of cash sales. And uh, this is a model that has been working uh, very well for, uh, for the East Africa market. And we see companies now moving towards the West African market, where for the first time we did, uh, we did, uh, we did see a huge growth in, in the sales of solar water pumps in, in the West African market. Um, partly also, this is because of, you know, the seasonality that comes with, uh, uh, the, you know, that we've seen in the last rounds. Uh, the dry season is usually at the second half of the year, and uh, most farmers do want uh, to cushion themselves from, uh, uh, from the effects of, you know, the dry climate, and, and they do solar, solar water pumps. So, uh, for, for solar water pumps, we also did talk to, uh, to a couple of companies that, you know, that, that uh, participated in this round, and they did mention that um, programs uh, such as the Global Lipa BF program has been a very, very crucial uh, lifeline in these very tough times, uh, where, um, as you would imagine, uh, some of these companies do have to make the installations themselves, uh, but, uh, but with the restrictions uh, that, you know, that have been put down by in, in most countries, the lockdowns, inter-country inter travel, and still uh, uh, the, the restrictions, the curfews, um, this has very much slowed down uh, the sales of these appliances to the end consumer. But you know, as 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 ca ca countries continue to open up and, and as people uh, learn how to live with this uh, pandemic, we 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 do hopefully uh, are going to see some uh, some some increase in sales. So. I uh, will pass it over to uh, to Andrew to give his second insight. Um, so, Andrew, over to you. Thanks, Mike. Yes. So, in the final insight, we wanted to touch upon uh, some impact metrics, which, uh, for the first time, we are reporting for um, different African appliances. So, working with Gogla, the Efficiency for Access Coalition have developed impact metrics for TVs and fans. Uh, and this is ongoing work as well as we kind of look to cover uh, refrigerators and solar water pumps in later rounds and expand on the insights that we can um, that we can provide for uh, different impacts of off-grid appliances. Um, starting with TVs, though, so we can see that approximately 3. Uh, 3.7 million people are benefiting from TVs and around 70,000 people are using TVs to support a business. Um, some further insights are that um, solar powered TVs are playing a crucial role in providing information to householders as I touched upon in my previous insight and the E4A coalition and 60 decibels research has shown that 90% of off-grid TV customers have reported that they're their knowledge has increased due to owning a TV. Um, in fans, we can see that the, there's around over 5 million people uh, are benefiting from uh, the use of off-grid fans. Um, and as it shows here on the slide, the, the vast majority of sales there are in South Asia, which is in contrast to TVs where the uh, vast majority are in Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, Around 30,000 people are also using a fan to support their businesses. Uh, and then further research from, from E4A shows that 92% uh, of customers in Bangladesh observed an improvement to family health. So, so really kind of showing that 
uh, the use of fans is critical to, to help improve lives in very, very hot and humid climates. Okay, so that's, uh, that's us for the insights and I'll hand back to Susie. Thanks so much, everyone. Really, really um, powerful to see the, the data translated uh, through your description of the, of the numbers, uh, but also some background narrative and, and the dynamics that are happening. Um, but now we're going to hand over to the audience. So please do continue to pop your questions into the Q&A um, area. Uh, we've had a few in already. We actually had a few people um, requesting to see to know about the, the size of the different size categories of TVs. Uh, Andrew has popped the answer to that into the chat. But for anyone that has missed that and is curious, um, extra large TVs um, are 30 inches and above. Large are 24 to 29 inches. Medium, 18 to 23 inches. And small, 12 to 17 inches. Um, that's also described um, in the report as well. But yeah, for a, a few of you were, were wondering about those sizing of, of, uh, of TVs. Um, we've had a few other clarifying questions around, uh, you know, what's really impacting these numbers this time round. Uh, and, and Leo, um, I'll maybe turn to you on a couple of these, actually. I know you've got some insights into the question around supply chains, where uh, Rebecca is asking, we've heard throughout the last 12 months uh, of problems within supply chains as a result of disruption caused by the pandemic and demand for components. Uh, and she's wondering how much of the reported sales levers could be caused by problems with supply uh, rather than problems with demand. Uh, but while you're answering that, I might also get you to, to answer the question around whether the, the numbers may have dropped, um, not just because of, of these uh, demand and, and supply dynamics, but also if it was because there was any you know, challenges with data collection during the pandemic as well. Uh, so Leah, maybe over to you on those two clarifying questions. Absolutely, and thank you for those questions, and thanks, Susie. Absolutely, there have definitely been a lot of different... Um, I'll address the second point first, because it, it covers very well. Um, specifically, you're asking about the supply chain um, issues. So the supply chain really has um, very many different levels of... Uh, just have, has experienced many different levels of disruption. And yes, these are going to be contributing towards these figures. Um, a quick summary of what have, have been seen are levels of disruption on everywhere from the factory in terms of staff, of course, having um, questionable access to um, get into factories to some of the large component sourcing problems we've seen. Um, everything from in the news, we've been seeing this in terms of microchips um, for, uh, and semiconductors, et cetera. So we have received um, a, a fair amount of, of uh, anecdotal comments that there have been challenges sourcing various different components. But what um, is worth emphasizing is overall on that level, many different companies have different approaches to this. Um, there are different amounts of stock stockpiled already, which are being sold through, um, and a wide variety of different factors on that level. Um, then again, the next level is actually the shipping, uh, moving products around the world, and of particular importance, um, typical bottlenecks we all know on importation um, that are face have been exacerbated again through personnel challenges, um, through a variety of other logistical problems, or even crackdowns on um, the actual import of products from certain regions at certain times. So absolutely, companies have been reporting um, anecdotal impacts, but we are not um, sourcing those as, as um, behind any of the large market shifts. So yes, we are seeing and attributing um, a lot of these to the demand, although we do acknowledge that there is a, a factor from that supply. Um, we haven't been able to quantify that because of the nature of the report. So I think that's um, as accurate as we can get there. Um, and the same applies for this question about um, some companies, yes, again, if they've been under stress or have been um, actually experiencing very low sales, several companies have chosen not to report any sales at all. Um, or that, um, yeah, because of, because of either of those reasons. So again, this has been happening. But I forget, Chef, at the beginning, did we um, show the number of participants? Uh, definitely in the overall report, we can we track that over time. And you can see that actually we still have had a very high and very representative level of participation overall. Um, and again, how we often um, look at this on the back end are uh, looking at the companies who make the most significant contributions, um, checking whether they're still participating. And so we are seeing a consistent representation 
of, um, of companies this round. So again, that is a factor, but seen to be a marginal one. I think we'll move on to uh, other questions. Thanks but so much. Fabulous. Thanks, Leo. Um, a couple of questions for you, Mike. Um, I, I think you answered the first one, whether the um, uh, the RBF spike in 2000, sorry, solar water pump spike in, in 2019 was related to, to RBFs. And I, I think that's yes, but please, if you um, had more that you could share there, please do. And then I think a question on why we're, we are seeing this uptick uh, slightly in these sales numbers around solar water pumps. If you've got any uh, insights into, into why that's happening uh, for the last part of 2020. Yeah, thanks, thanks, uh, Susie. That's that's a very good question. So, um, so sometimes you know when we receive this data, this data, we also have to ask ourselves, you know, these very questions. And um, uh, to answer this second question, uh, yeah, we have seen an increase, a slight increase in the sales of solar water pumps, uh, particularly in the East Africa market and West Africa market. Uh, but uh, you know, as I mentioned, solar water pumps do have a very high uh, demand. The demand for solar water pumps is very, very high uh, affordability is an issue. Uh, and now, uh, you know, considering the impact of the pandemic, uh, this has kind of slowed down uh, uh, the sales. But uh, this is probably partly because we can see uh, some of the major players in the, uh, in the solar water pump space moving on into new markets. Uh, there has been a huge buzz in the West African space uh, where, uh, where we have, uh, you, know, you know, a lot of focus by development partners moving into uh, the off-grid space of, of the West African market, considering uh, huge countries like Nigeria. But uh, this is uh, this is probably one of the reasons. And another reason we can we, we can see from this report is that you know we have a little bit more uh, of, you know of uh, participation in this um, uh, in this in this uh, participation by companies in this uh, in this region. So uh, this yeah. Partly by uh, you know companies uh, increasing uh, a few companies reporting from this uh, from these markets and also uh, mostly because uh, some some of the major players in the in the solar water pumps are moving into some of these new and un un unexplored markets for solar water pumps. Great, thanks, Mike. Um, We've got a question here around um, whether the increased demand for mobile financial services use during the pandemic lockdown may have contributed to an uptick in some of the numbers that we're seeing uh, and whether we've, we've looked into that in terms of correlating data. Uh, from my understanding, I don't think we've looked at that specifically in relation to this data collection exercise, but maybe Leo, coming back to you, I'm just wondering if, uh, again, anecdotally, uh, you might have heard anything around uh, mobile financial services and their impact on the pandemic and the sales numbers we're seeing. Absolutely, um, thanks. And just to clarify, thank you for that really good question. Um, the World Bank is also one of the main supporters of CGAP, the consultative group um, uh, against poverty. And you may have been familiar. So they are one of the, uh, I would um, look to them for the kind of insight that uh, into these areas. Um, they're basically, a lot of their work has focused on the uh, use of digital fi um, finance, mobile telephony, uh, the, those whole dimension um, of, of our sector. And I have not seen anything yet on this. Uh, there is also the, um, the latest um, World Bank development report uh, has focused on the use of data and the importance of data for development. Uh, so maybe we can circulate some uh, links where there's a lot of um, activity looking into these kind of questions across the whole developmental impact, right, of this new, uh, increasingly digital world that we've all experienced from using more Zoom um, to maybe using more of these digital services. So I would say that um, uh, you, you're definitely onto something there, um, Amory, and uh, clearly you're very familiar with that sector. So if you've got some hunches, I would say that the evidence is bearing that out. Um, but I want to add one really strong caveat, and maybe this addresses a little bit Andrew's um, previous question, Andrew Pridding, um, have we seen change in the last mile distributors? basically let's just remember that a crisis is happening at a time where companies are losing sales harder to make sales and therefore to shift business strategy and particularly to invest in any new digital platforms or to move over um, that really is only the um, the privilege of companies who have sufficient capital and or investors and or willingness and ability to pivot so i think a lot of these are great ideas which are possible to turn things around, 
Um, but the, the question will be how many companies are in a position to actually do that. I think what both of you are pointing at here are also areas for development partners to start to look into and to recognize how they could channel their support to companies to allow them to pivot or to expand. And as we're all trying to say, how can we build back better? Um, how, but frankly, a lot of companies are also struggling to survive. So you're really pointing at some of the uh, key issues here. I believe that yes, many companies have succeeded in pivoting, as you've said, and that is because they have recognized, let's say there's a trend for more people wanting to use digital services um, for many reasons, not least of which is to reduce transmission possibilities um, and lockdown restrictions, et cetera. So yes, let, let's, uh, we haven't got data on that yet. It's still very early days. Um, so I think you can accept that's partly why we don't have those links yet. Um, I hope that you're pointing at something which will be looked into by the broader sector. And I'm sure this is something um, that uh, under SMAP and the World Bank Group, as well as um, the E4A Coalition and Gogla can all take back uh, some of these points to our, our members um, and work on providing further insight. Thank you. Thanks, Leo. Maybe there was a question here around the procedure for the data collection and how big, uh, big the sample is. Maybe, Chef, I'm just wondering if very briefly you might be able to touch on, on that. And then perhaps within that answer as well, a question also on whether the analysis and the data that we're getting can help to quantify the positive impact of government interventions or programs or, or initiatives like RBS. Um, if I might ask you yeah, to, to share a little bit on the procedure for the data collection and the, and the sample, the companies that, that work with us on this, and then maybe that, that question around uh, how we can, you know, what we can do to, to really understand the impact of those government or programmatic interventions. Sure, yeah, thank you for the question. Um, in terms of sample size, um, and this also refers to the comment that Leo just made, um, is that we, the total sample size of this round was 100 companies. Um, it was 107 companies in the in the H2 2019 and also in the previous round. Uh, so overall, it stayed relatively stable. Um, in terms of the procedure, it takes around five to six months. Um, and companies submit their data to us through a survey. Uh, we then go to uh, through a rigorous data quality control, um, after which we analyze the, analyze the data. Um, and we then publish it uh, in a in a year in a half yearly report. We also have a, a platform that companies can access uh, and, 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 and manipul manipulate their own data. So each company that, uh, that participates in, uh, in a data collection uh, gets access to this report, uh, to, this, uh, to this platform. Um, and we hope to, in that way, also give companies uh, something back in the, in the time and the effort they invest in, uh, in submitting their data. Um, on the positive effects of, of, of government intervention or initi initiatives like RBFs, um, we don't have the data to really quantify the positive effect, but we do see what I just also mentioned uh, during uh, during the presentation is that we uh, we see uh, we, we usually see a, a, a quite an uptick in sales where we see positive uh, where we see uh, government interventions of uh, programmatic uh, programmatic support, um, but yeah, right now we don't have any data or, uh, or tools available that we can really yeah, rigorously quantify uh, that effect to, uh, to what extent then sales really uh, increase. Thanks, Jeff. And while I have you, there is a question here on uh, any data breakdown between AC and DC appliances. Um, my understanding is we don't break that down as yet, but, uh, but can you clarify perhaps? No, that's correct. Yeah, no, we don't, uh, we don't collect that unfortunately at the moment. So uh, we're not available to or able to, uh, to share that. Um, but maybe we can just complement that, Chef. Um, uh, one of the key points is that we are expecting that the majority of these are DC appliances because um, of the filter, if you like, that these are products being sold with solar home systems um, or uh, from the parallel market that support off-grid appliances. So to clarify, yes, we are, we are not asking Panasonic or LG to report on their TVs. Um, the companies that we are working with are sourced from the Global Leap um, uh, portfolio, if you like, of um, high performance quality off-grid appliances. And the, if you look at the tables in the report, you'll see that there's a great amount of solar power companies who are selling appliances as well. And again, the, almost exclusively, they, none of those companies include inverters in their product range 
again, therefore, the products are largely DC. Thank you. Thanks for that clarification, Nia. That's fantastic. Uh, I, I think we've only got time for the last two questions that I spot in here. And, and Andrew, perhaps I can turn to you. Uh, Christine is asking how much financing or pay go is used in the appliance part of the sector, you know, whether, whether all of those, those larger appliances are, are, are financed. And then perhaps I can sneak in another sort of slightly linked question uh, that's also on solar water pumps that's come in uh, to say, you know, could some of the, uh, the, the, the the uptick in numbers also be related to the fact that people's focus has shifted to agriculture and irrigation uh, in the lockdown? So perhaps if you could take uh, take a swipe at both of those, that would be fantastic. Sure. Yeah. <clears throat> Sorry, I lost my voice for a second. Um, I think for the first question that... Um, it really depends on the appliance itself and the, the location. So we see quite a geographic split between um, between appliance sales with sales of fans being predominant in South Asia, where they're predominantly sold on a cash basis, um, whereas other, other appliances such as TVs, um, solar water pumps, um, they might be more predominant in sub-Saharan Africa and sold uh, there on a on a PAYGO basis. Um, but I think the data does show that, that PAYGO is becoming more and more uh, important for, especially for larger appliances, to allow people to uh, pay for them over time and, and really afford them. Um, in terms of the, the second question on um, whether or not solar water pump numbers could be attributed to an increase in, in shift to agriculture. Um, I'm not entirely sure on that and I, I don't want um, I don't want to speculate um, but that is you know could be possible. I, I'd open that up to the other panelists to see if they had um, more strong opinions on that. Yeah I can I can just comment comment on this uh, Andrew and yeah, uh, I I think this is this is something that you know was noted very much in, in you know in Kenya. I don't know if in other countries uh, this was also experienced, where uh, uh, you know when the lockdown happened, uh, schools were closed, uh, many uh, workplaces have been closed, and and people, most people, for some reason or another, they just uh, you know defaulted uh, to agriculture. You know whether it's poultry farming, whether it's uh, you know just uh, subsistence or even just uh, small commercial farming, and uh, this can be a reason why this uh, you know this uh, we we see this increase in sales. But this is very much uh, this hasn't been uh, you know investigated in any way. But it's something it's it's a it's 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 a very interesting topic to just kind of find out. I I do know that in Kenya I've seen that kind of you know shift, but uh, we can't really conclusively say that you know this is. You know, many people, you know, shifted to that unless there is a, there's a proper survey that is, uh, that is done. Thanks, Mike. Um, I'm afraid we, we're on top of time and we just have one uh, last thing is to obviously all of our panelists and thank you, Tosha, for those fantastic um, insights and introductions. I'm hoping we can keep you as the audience just for one more minute and share one last poll in terms of um, how, uh, how, you know, how insightful this presentation was for you. Um, it helps us again to figure out if there's other things that we, we need to be doing with the presentations moving forward. Indeed, perhaps insights for the, for the report themselves. If there are more detailed um, comments that you have on how we could perhaps improve the report, improve the webinar structure, uh, you can see Chef's email at the bottom of the screen. Uh, the slides will be shared with you, so you'll also have that in there. So please do, um, do email. If your question hasn't been answered, please also do feel to email us uh, with that and we'll try to respond as well. Um, I'm just going to leave the poll open for a few seconds. Um, I don't know if you can quite see the numbers coming through, but I'm pleased to say that for the majority, it does look like this was, was indeed useful. A few more people who are saying that it could contain more information. Um, I'll just end that poll in one more second. Um, so indeed, if there was other kinds of information that you would be interested in, as I say, please do pop an email through to Chef and we can try to uh, see what we can do to um, uh, enable uh, a greater wealth of information to be shared in the webinar and just ensure that we're certainly in the report if we don't have time for it here. Uh, and lastly, before we close, um, I will um, just let you guys uh, 
uh, see here a couple of the different links that we have in terms of the report page, our impact hub on, on the Goggler website that has more information. And we actually have a new uh, data and market intelligence manager, Oliver Reynolds, who's just joined our team. Uh, and so for questions going forward, Oliver is also very much available to help and answer. Um, but yeah, as I say, just uh, lastly, to thank again our panelists, to thank Atosha for all of the insights they shared, very, very much appreciated. And to thank you all for being uh, a participating and attentive audience. Um, take care for now. <laughs>